Hello, welcome to another interview of Coming Down to Earth, an online summit about conflict transformation that sets the, the, the ground to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm really, really thrilled to have today with me Alnur Lada, who is a good friend. He has uh, been an uh, activist, a social entrepreneur. He co-founded The Rules, a global citizens movement that aimed to address the root causes of inequality. He used to be a board member of Greenpeace USA. He's a partner at Purpose. He's involved in many, many different things that in a way I would say, uh, try to nurture the field, the field of social change in ways that can be more generative to bring about the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. You have also, Alnor, you've also founded the Emergence Network with me at the Biocomolaf and some other friends. It's, I'm really happy. Welcome, my friend. Mm, thank you for having me, Nuno. Good to see you. Yeah, so... I'm talking to you from, from Faro, from south of Portugal. I think you are, you are in Costa Rica. I'm in um, Costa Rica. Yeah, so could you please... So the, conf, the, the summit is about um, conflict transformation and uh, this interview is in, this, in, the, um, in the context of the first week where we try to look at in which ways our ways of looking into conflict and addressing and dealing with, dealing with conflicting situations in, between people and in groups in society have been problematic and keeping us stuck in producing uh, results nobody wants that either people fly or fight and there's a lot of the dissipation of energy from that are tar is targeted for change in this um, difficult, difficult and challenging situation. So I'm curious to see a bit if you could talk us about, you know, looking at your life journey, your experience within these spaces, in what ways have you been seeing that we are stuck in these patterns of response that really are uh, not producing the results we would like? And, and you, you asked that question as in, um, in sort of progressive movements, Yes, yeah, so People looking at really, change. yeah, you, we can also then talk a bit, if, if you want, you can also talk a bit about your reading of, of the mainstream and, you know, like how all, how our society is unfolding and, and, and more deeper patterns that are, I think they kind of intertwine mm -hmm. the patterns of society at large with spaces of change where people go there with, I mean, we all grow up in this kind of setting. So we all have things to work with as we go through space to spaces of change, wanting to embody a different world. So yeah, I just want to, yeah. let, let's see what, what's emerging for you and we go from there. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, a lot of my perspective comes from um, understanding reality as sort of fractal manifestations of, of larger or more micro emanations. And so we, we have uh, these sort of interactions with people on a, on a sort of person to person, you know, peer to peer level. And what, what's happening though, from a psycho spiritual level, let's say, is that we're replicating patterns that are in the, the sort of our immediate vicinity, our communities, but also the broader culture. And this has sort of always been my, my, my starting point is really to, to first understand the, the, the culture, the, the water in which we swim, because it, it's actually informing us in all sorts of levels, conscious, subconscious, unconscious, semi-conscious. And it is actually the, the prime vector of behavior. And so, for, for me, that's really the starting place is to understand, okay, well, what's the culture that we're in? And I think what's, what we don't often fully internalize as people who are working in social change is that we think we're fighting something external to us, but it, we're nested and embedded in this broader culture. And because we study it often and spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, 
what are the machinations of late stage capitalism, of neoliberalism, of extractivism, of patriarchy, of colonialism, etc. We often get infected with the mimetic aspects of those thought forms. And, and you know, as, as a starting place, you know, when you enter a room and you say, okay, well, what are the key thought forms that people in this room are studying? Uh, feminism, Marxism, post-capitalism, and then really thinking through th what are the implications on that person's body and that person's psyche for having internalized and or battled this thought form for, for so many years. And, you know, this is not discourse that happens often in the social change space, but just even bringing it to light, you know, um, often when I work with different social movements and, you know, when we, we ran the rules uh, as an eight year project from, from 2012 to, till the end of 2019, we were all often in a support role for social movements, you know, peasant movements, farmer movements, indigenous movements, largely in the global south. And you know, especially I think when we, when people who have been socialized in the West work with indigenous communities, uh, there's this uh, romanticization that happens and, uh, um, and also a, a sort of an admiration, which is deserved, uh, especially when you're working with community organizers who have you know, risked everything to, to be where they are. And, and what happens is that, you know, for, for us, what we realized through this work is what's the, mo the, the, the most important thing, especially early in these relationships, is to really understand the ideological terrain and the mimetic landscape in which they are swimming, living, walking, breathing. Um, and, and often that dialogue helps inform so many other things. And it's just a practice, you know, it's, it's not, not to say it's the only way to approach these things, but it, it does just sort of zoom us out into the broader culture, which then allows us to come to this, you know, peer to peer interaction. Could you clarify perhaps for to, to the listeners, like what, what do you understand by memes? Because it might mm -hmm. be a term that is not like very familiar to many people. So, uh, you know, we, we in pop culture, it's used as a sort of, you know, lol cats or internet memes. But a meme is the a sort of base unit of culture. And memetics is this growing science, maybe for the last 20 years, um, at the intersection of cognitive linguistics, uh, evolutionary theory, especially cultural evolution, um, and neuroscience. And it's really about how do ideas manifest in our bodies? How do, what's the biography of ideas? Uh, how do ideas move from one mind to another? And what's their trajectory yeah. in culture? So how also they propagate and how certain ideas get successful at really expanding and embedding a culture and some not and just left behind and how that exactly dynamics yeah, is, like a, a shorthand is a meme is a cultural equivalent of a gene, yeah. you know, and, but it's more like a disease, <laughs> you know, in the sense that they're communicable, we catch them, they move from one person to another. And then there's also a kind of neoplatonic spiritual overlay of this, which is yeah. these ideas are deities and they're thought forms that actually manipulate us in order for us to, to feed them. Yeah, so I'm curious to see like from, from, I mean, you worked a lot on this and the rules was a lot based on really looking into narratives and, and means that might get us like in there our capacity to, to bring about change. I'm curious, like, what have you been observing that are deeply embedded memes, deep, deeply embedded ideas in mainstream, in, let's say in the Western worldview that might be um, getting people stuck in dynamics again of, of, you know, dealing with conflicts and looking into conflicts that, that might be problematic and, and yeah, created all sorts of problems. Yeah, so there's, maybe we'll start, we'll start at the macro and come down to the, to the micro. You know, at, at, a, at a macro level, there's the, the, the kind of, you know, the root meme, which is our human separation from nature and our superiority over nature. 
and our role as uh, sort of on top of the evolutionary hierarchy, as opposed to being the youngest species. Uh, and so rather than humility, we, we come at this with hubris. And this, this anthropocentric worldview is, it's so deeply embedded in the things we do and how we treat each other and how we treat the natural world around us, even those in the climate movement, that I don't think we we're fully understand, we fully understand the, the consequences of our behavior. And so it's this very interesting thing where, uh, you know, we, we, we sort of bring this sort of anthropocentric bias into everything we do. And so often what happens is our solutions, our alternatives are, are, are in sort of one domain of reality. And that itself is a problem because then what happens is we, we over attribute the human realm. And when you over attribute the human realm, there's usually somebody to blame, somebody else to blame. And uh, it, it's, it's a root of a lot of problems in a, in a, let's say, a more unseen way. Whereas, you know, in a more mystical approach, if you and I are, are um, having some form of tension in our relationship, you know, uh, depending on, on, on the culture and the time and, you know, the, the metaphysical beliefs and the root ideologies and all of that, but I'm just going to generalize and say, you know, there, there may be an understanding that the, uh, our ancestors are in spiritual battle in some way uh, or elements of the more than human world, uh, the, the wind or, you know, perhaps the animal we happen to be eating in, in, in our lunch meeting, you know, their spirit, you know, is, is influencing the tension between us, you know? But it's, as soon as we eliminate that, all those possibilities, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're, we're sort of eating the carcass of another animal over lunch without having honored it or killed it ourselves or having preyed on it, et cetera, uh, uh, you know, an animal that had high levels of adrenaline when it was hunted down or tortured or whatever, uh, that, that possibility, leaves the, 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 the sort of realm of, of our discourse because we don't know it even exists. So that's just an example at a high level, you know, of how uh, ideology around uh, human exceptionalism and human supremacy sort of makes its way into our interactions, you know, ignoring ancestral forces, ignoring elemental forces, ignoring spirit forces, etc. Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that we, we, we lost touch of that nuanced, sensible way of, delicate way of meeting the world where we understand that, you know, there's a lot of things at play and that we, we, we are somehow the shape we take in each moment is informed by all those things that are taking place in that moment, plus all that is behind us and in somehow all the potential also that's also ahead. And we exactly. tend to have this kind of very central place of, of putting all the responsibility on, on the human and on us. And, and then, yeah, we, we, don't, we fail to acknowledge all the other dynamics. And then, and then there's another related one, uh, sort of thought form ideology, which is um, materialism, rationalism, scientific reductionism, dualism, you know, this, this whole sort of set of beliefs that were imported from uh, enlightenment thinking that has infected the entire Western world and, and really any culture that has come into touch with the, the Western realm, where we see ourselves as atomized individuals. We believe that there is an objective truth. And, you know, I would say this is probably the root of the majority of our internal conflicts. Because if there is an objective truth that I understand, you must therefore be wrong if you don't come to the same conclusion as me. And you know, what, what this does, th this is a, you know, a whole complex of ideas that are sort of internalized, almost like uh, architecture 
within the body. And it requires such a deep level of programming and practice to be able to get outside of that. And, you know, you just look at the, the sort of the way uh, we, we even think of something like productivity, you know, and, and purpose. Like, what is the work we're doing and why? If we look into, it, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a big corporate um, hegemonic organization uh, l like a bank or, you know, an accountancy or a multinational or retail company or whatever, uh, or, in, you know, another neoliberal institution like an NGO or a more free organization like a collective or a social movement, the idea of productivity has been merged with the idea of efficiency, has been merged with the idea of rationality, has been merged with the idea of linearity. You know, I do X, therefore this should happen. And what it's done is it's actually created this oppressive, tyrannical, invisible architecture around us that then is in a fractal way reflected in our bodies and our uptightness uh, and our belief that we should be doing something right now. And, and what happens in a group environment is if someone is not as productive, quote unquote, whatever that means in our subjective way, which we've now turned into an objective truth, then we, we are upset with them. And if we as a group are not, quote unquote, achieving X, Y, or Z, we are upset with that group environment. And we're actually importing discord by the very act of believing that some set outcome needs to happen. And not to say it shouldn't happen, but it's how do we agree on what's happening? How do we agree on the manner by which that should happen? How do we decide that this is our collective behavior? And this is also uh, the way I actually want to do that work. You know, that, that, those dialogues don't happen. You come into a, a work environment and it's like, here's how we do things. This is what we do. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's widget making or social change. And then the belief is that you'll just adapt to that and do that. And so we, we've been deeply colonized in our approach to, 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 to work. And it's, it is deeply ideological, even though it's not necessarily seen as ideological. Yeah, I was just, uh, I, I was just thinking like how much that, that really shapes in a way or really describes what we are, what, what I'm observing with the whole phenomena of the coronavirus, that just like this narrative around, this is something external, something alien that is came to attack us and now we must win that war and kind of uh, uh, extract it, you know, put it away so that we can go back to our, to our normal lives. And the response has been a lot on containment, control, confinement. And I've heard in mainstream, in mainstream um, uh, conversations, I, I haven't heard anybody asking like, you know, what is really a virus or what, what is this thing that supposedly is not alive, is not, is like something in between life and death, which like is what some people describe as a virus. What is it trying to, you know, inform us or invite us into that? Just sitting in that space of not knowing and, and deep inquiry. That's non-existent in most of the, of the mainstream ways. So. And, and then, yeah, completely, right? And, and, and I'm not even saying this thought form of human supremacy and separation from nature uh, or this complex of thought forms in, in uh, rationalization, atomization, linearity, et cetera, are, are necessarily even like cause and effect. But, but I, I'm just sort of pointing to the, 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 the cultural milieu that is informing our interaction with each other as, as humans that we're not fully aware of, you know, that's, that's just there. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the third, and, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll stop there because we, we, you know, this, this is kind of, uh, could be infinite, right? Depending on, on, on your lens of analysis, but it is the idea of identity. And it's a sort of a strange thing to say, 
And I'm going to, I, I will pull a sort of conclusion from all three of these, uh, sort of perhaps where they point to. But, uh, you know, in, in the Sufi tradition, for example, we, we have this idea that you have a universal identity and you have your uh, incarnated identity. You came into this body, you know, you have an ego, you have a, a sort of history, you, you have a, a, a sort of lineage and ancestry and DNA and personality and all of those things. But, but in our culture, your, your primary identity is the universal identity. And your secondary identity is your individual identity. And the, the whole aim and, and sort of purpose from an ontological perspective is to merge your individual identity into the universal identity, not amputating it, not separating it, honoring who you are, honoring your body, the physicality and all of that, but, but sort of getting back to that place. And, and, you know, you have glimpses of the universal identity through prayer and meditation and psychedelic experiences, etc. But it's your, your sort of primary goal of your life is to sort of merge back into that place. And, and that's why death is celebrated. That's the sort of opening, that's the portal to, to, to be back there. So I, I just say that example, not to say it's right, because, you know, no, well, what is right? You know, all, all culture is deluded in its own, in its own subjective way, right? Um, but now look at Western culture. We may or may not even have an idea of universal identity. Uh, if we do, it's some, you know, transcendental other, uh, a, a God that we pray to in, in the sort of Judeo-Christian uh, Islamic, you know, the sort of Abrahamic traditions uh, and other traditions. But the primary focus of everything is our individual identity. And we reify that individual identity at every single touch point, whether it's our personal ID cards, our name, our preferences, right? Especially in the Western culture, our, our, uh, you know, you look at Instagram, it's essentially preference pornography. It's like, here's what I like, here's what I enjoy, this is what defines me. And if you live in a culture that deifies the sense of, of individual identity to that degree, of course you're going to have conflict in every environment where other atomized, individualized superegos enter space. And we think somehow that we are separate from it in progressive movements or social movements or anarchist groups or whatever. And, and what, what's, what actually happens is that because we have a desire for some social change that's outside of us, there's a subconscious self-reward mechanism that goes on, right? Where, where, where lefties believe and progressives believe, well, you know, I could be like that Goldman Sachs banker I went to college with. Uh, and I could be like that douchebag lawyer that's making all this money. But no, I've decided to do this work. And so... Therefore, uh, you know, I'm not egoic. And as soon as you sort of deny the fact that we are egoic beings in a culture that lionizes the individual identity, then you're moving into a space of deep shadow. And, and, and you'll see, and you know, I know, Nuno, you've felt this for many people in, in the movement space as well because there's no financial reward for the work we do, and there's very little external award, uh, you know, what is it to be a, a famous activist? Like, I, I don't know what the height of that is. Um, uh, you know, it's sort of embarrassing if you do get to any of those states. Like if you start to win awards for, you know, what is essentially service work, there's something wrong. And so the way they get their, their um, uh, external gratification is, is, amongst the left or amongst anarchist circles or amongst social movement circles or the world social forum community or whatever. And, and there, there's a lot of sort of monstrous behavior that occurs as a result. And because the external world is not validating us in the same way, we seek validation through imposition. 
And some of the, the meanest, most callous people I've ever met are some of the greatest activists in the world. And so I would say, you know, identity is the problem. Preference is the problem. And so now th 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 this is going to come off as, well, well what do we do? And, and, and th this is somehow some, you know, impasse, some metaphysical impasse. And what I'd say is all three of these thought forms that I, I would say are, are some of the core roots of conflict, separation from nature, rational materialism, and the reification and deification of the individual ego are all rooted in a, let's say, um, a very terrestrial worldview. And so the, the antidote to them on some level is uh, essentially, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to even say, say the word because I, I understand the resistance that will come to it, but I would say a spiritual practice. If you look at the mystical traditions and most indigenous traditions, the, the, the kind of sole aim, the ontology moves to the space where we're trying to transcend subject object duality. That, that is the practice, whether that's Sufi whirling dervish work, tantra work, psychedelic work, the whole aim is to transcend the idea of the other and re-enter that cosmic mind, that universal identity. We don't have a culture that rewards that work, nor creates space for it, uh, nor actually even has the, the, the room for the discourse to say the basic first principles. Why are we here? Where are we going? Why are we doing this at work? And if we just jump into our political work because something bothers us or we think there's an injustice in the world, what we're doing is, and, and you know, you talk to most activists, like when they got um, activated to do this work, you know, at some point at a, at a very young age, you know, I, I became interested in the climate movement when I was like eight years old and I started to understand species extinction and climate change. So my, my whole quest for 20 years was this unconscious quest of, of uh, you know, what my eight-year-old self felt was injustice, you know, and that's who was showing up to, to, to meetings till I was whatever, 28, was this like hurt boy uh, who felt this deep sense of betrayal from, from the external world. And you know, maybe only in my last 12, 15 years have I really taken the responsibility and not even to say I'm there in any way, this is just a practice, but where I've deeply embedded my practice into my political work, because I used to think my spiritual life and my political work were separate. And what I've started to understand in this period of time since my mid-20s is that there is no distinction. My spiritual work is a reflection of my political work and, and vice versa. There can be no compartmentalization. And this idea that, well, you know, there's the new age idea, well, you just work on yourself first and then you can go and contribute to the outside world is, is utter bullshit and spiritual escapism because it's actually through the struggle and through the political work that these sort of deeper identities are forged. And also the, the you know, political idea that I'm committed to the struggle, I therefore don't have the time or the ability or the interest or whatever to engage in that transmigration of the soul to some place that's beyond the immediacy of now is um, a materialist rationalist cop-out. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of, where I sit with when I, when I come to the place of conflict is I, I, I have an instinctual and lived experience that so many of our conflicts is uh, stemming from the root of, of these three things, which then lead to the, the so what of actually, if I'm going to work with someone politically, if I'm going to be in space with someone, I want to know they're in that inquiry. I want to know that they're in an inquiry of why they're here, and where they're going to go, and also collectively, why are we here, and where are we going? Because, you know, if not, it makes it very, it makes it very difficult. And some of the deepest um, betrayals I've had in, in the movement space 
has been, have been people who have a very reified sense of identity and no broader spiritual metaphysical understanding. Well, thank you so much for that. I was, uh, yeah, I was thinking like how to, to, to resume all you said was a lot. Maybe some things that stayed with me very strongly were, well, basically this idea that, that there is no real difference between inner and outer and that, that whole dichotomy that people, some people are more oriented for action and just don't want to have conversations around what's, what's happening inside of us and, and in, in this kind of cultural milieu from where our, our behaviors emanate. Um, and then the people want to want to explore that, and there's there's this. I see a lot in in social change spaces, a lot of those energies being pulled like this is two different things. And just I think you you mentioned in a very clear way that yeah, spiritual and and real world action, uh, real world exploration of what we are here to do, and the spiritual aspect of it are are two sides of the same thing, two, two manifestations of the same, they are intertwined. And another thing that, um, that stayed very, very strongly was this idea of, of flow or of movement. When I hear you talk about identity, I, I feel that, that as many people these days are being pulled both ideologically, ideologically but in also any, mo most of our ways of being and of expressing in the world we are being called or pulled to be rigid you know like to, to be very self-deterministic of this is who i am and you know either you like me or you're not and mm -hmm. you know and and really fail to acknowledge that actually what i sense from what you said is like we can see someone and think we know someone because we just meet the the shape of the person in in the way it's acting in the world but it's actually the movement that is the expression of that of that self in trying to meet the universal soul or so for me what i read was yes we are connected to the universe and we are part of this larger whole which may which i i believe as a consciousness as a universal consciousness but we are all unique in the role we have in this life to towards you know connecting with that higher higher self or a higher universal soul or whatever people want to call it god or so that that movement is is our our way of expressing and, and meeting that in the world and i think people get very stuck in in um, attaching themselves to ideas or to to different things even clothes and material stuff to say this is who i am Mm -hmm. and and this who we are as opposite to what others are so i think that's that's for sure a crucial element that creates all sorts of, of problems and tensions and conflicts between people mm -hmm. so yeah there's a lot of space there for what it means for us to meet each other as if for the first time you know every time and meet the situations with that kind of openness to be really uh, authentic because another thing that I think you didn't mention directly but I heard at least the way I was interpreting is that somehow this narrative of many activists of, of the hero's journey that I'm here to save the world and I'm going through all these ordeals and stuff you know to to bring about the better world and that somehow is also kind of being uh, meeting its limits in the sense that um uh, people often uh, are not real you know in putting out also things that are inner feelings of shame or of insufficiency or of different uh shadows that then because we don't want to see them we want to just feed into the heroes aspects they gain so much strength in the way we act even when we are even if you are unconscious to that and i see a lot of that in the dynamics you're saying people who have immense capacity and great ideas but in just the way they act in their in their way of bringing change their their shadow side just just wins over and and mm -hmm. and does all sorts of negative things or negative all sorts of negative impacts around mm -hmm. is there I, anything I, you'd like to add or comment to that yeah as we come no, to no 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 i i think also maybe just saying 
some of the, the, the sort of practices that could be cultural antidotes. And yeah, because we, we've sort of identified, you know, three core roots of conflict that, that stem from our, our, our culture and the, the sort of societal reward mechanisms, you know. Um, and, and especially around identity, you know, there's this whole complex, right? Attribution, who did it? Um, oh, there's a little one. Um, uh, is this my idea? You know, that, you know, all these sort of like notions of possession, private property, all, and, and to say that like every ideology has a shadow. And, um, you know, like I, I think, especially as men, but, but everyone needs to understand feminism and have a strong sort of feminist lens and critique uh, and understanding of patriarchy and power and also understand that uh, the, an unhealed archetype interacting with feminist ideology can also create hate for the masculine, othering, separation, similar to Marxism. I think a lot of the Marxist analysis is very powerful and the logical conclusion of uh, Marxist thought is this sort of, uh, you know, essentially totalitarian rule by the proletariat. And, and that sort of uh, underdog, you know, ideology, what, what it leads to in practice is when you get into the position of power, you then have the, you know, the reversal of the victim perpetrator cycle. And, and, and so, it, and look, it's true for sort of any ideology. And so the things I'd say in, in terms of practices, especially in groups, especially amongst community of people who are working together, the, the, the first is really uh, council space, co-council space. You know, if we're not in that type of dialogue with each other in council ways, where we are sitting in circle, where we can have discussions about what our ideology is, why that's our ideology, what the implications of that are, et cetera. We, we you know, you, you can only move at the speed of trust. And th that's where the trust gets built. And we, we, we have this idea that you just come into an organization or you come into a movement and you'll do X and I'll do Y in this compartmentalized way. And there's a, there's a I, I think it was David Abrams who said, who wrote this in the spell of the sensuous, he says, um, there is no truth. There is only the quality of relationships. There is no truth. There is only the quality of relationships, and and that's what circle ways do for us. And um, I see it as a key practice. And 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 this is not just you know assembly, social movement style. That's great for direct democracy and decision making process. But I'm talking smaller, more intimate uh, co counseling space within movements. Uh, the second is this, the idea of shared practice and not necessarily that we have to do it together, uh, but that we as a community are supporting each other. There's this bad lefty term called self-care. You know, everyone in the workplace talks about self-care, which is just another individualistic sort of atomized uh, uh, expression. But, but the idea that uh, the spiritual process is the primary process. We happen to be choosing political outlets for our spiritual work, and that's where our development is going to happen, but it's also where our karma is. You can't be an awake person in, in the middle of uh, the Kali Yuga, in the middle of the Dark Ages, in the middle of the Anthropocene, in the middle of late-stage capitalism, and not do something about what's happening on our planet right now. That's a abnegation of your responsibility as a human being, not, not as an activist. And the identity of being an activist as some kind of you know, special people who do stuff is, is, is problematic. And so I do think there is a sort of communal way to hold each other to our practices and to create the space and the time for us to be in that sort of you know, more mystical realm, in the realm of... Uh, no mind and trans mind and all of those things and, and creating that within the spaces we're within reminding each other that we are in a life ceremony 
And for me, that's a key part of, of the, the, the political work uh, and political practice. And then, and then the last thing that I'd say, which is also you know, a communal sport, is, is de-schooling. It's to actively understand what thought forms and what deities we're praying to, what the implications of reifying that thought form in our speech, in our behavior, in our embodiment, what that's doing to us, what that's doing to the people around us, and, and um, actively finding the antidote memes that we want to uh, recalibrate into our nervous systems. Wow, brother. And, yeah. Yeah, and they're both and, communal and, and, and individualistic, you know, as if, you know, there is no separation, of course, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I, I think it's time to, to end our interview. Was wonderful. I love this conversation. Actually, I felt the, the, that I want to continue somehow. So let's see what other conversations we might uh, engage and share with the larger audience. But for now, thank you so much for your contribution. Yeah, and... no, thank you, Nuno. Thanks for the work you do in the world and your time. And yeah, lots of love, brother. Good to see you. Thank you.